My role here is just to introduce, to welcome you, to wish you a very good day of discussions at the Wilson Center. And uh, I will now uh, pass uh, the floor to Aloysio de Lima Campos, who has organized this event uh, and uh, will conduct it from, from here on. Thank you. Thank you, Paulo. Uh, it's always an honor to be hosted here again, uh, and uh, now for the first time for, by the Brazilian Institute of the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, as chairman of the ABCI Institute, um, and for those of you who are not familiar with the Institute, there's a, uh, a little note about the Institute on the second page of your program, if you care to look at it. and. Um, Following that um, will be the agenda, and I've asked all the chairs of, um, uh, of the tables not to spend too much time introducing our guests. Uh, they're all very known, and if you want to know in detail who they are, it's in the program also. We have a short bio for every speaker in your program. So we would like to concentrate on the essence and, and what is important here today. Um, so again, um, uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, I hope we, I think we're going to have a fantastic day of discussion. This is our first panel. We have two speakers that are on the way. Uh, they had some problems with the traffic, some with flights, uh, but they'll all be here uh, and they'll be joining the, the, the table as they come in. So without further ado, I would like to pass the word to Birata Matos, who will be chairing this uh, first panel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Luizio, and uh, good morning for all. It's a pleasure to be back here in this event. I missed the last one, but uh, I attended the first one. And uh, seeing what happened since then is, is amazing, how uh, uh, Luizio managed this uh, program and uh, all these people, and it's uh, here uh, really a uh, successful uh, event. So for me, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we, due to the, the, the weather conditions, you see that uh, Mr. Thomas Felsberg is not here, so I'm replacing <laughs> him at the last time. And uh, uh, we have uh, uh, the people that we have here, all they, 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 they have an impressive resume uh, that you can uh, see in the program, therefore I will be waiving the introduction of every uh, panelist. We will start uh, with Mr. Roberto Azevedo, that will be... We will start with Roberto Azevedo, right? Yes. Uh, okay, but, okay. because uh, I was just following the order here. So let's start with Angelus uh, Pangratz, that's Deputy Chief of uh, the EU Emission Delegation. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I, um, I understand I'm given something like 10 minutes. Exactly. I, um, so let me try to... Um, to give you a quick overview. I also understand that we'll have some time for uh, uh, questions. Uh, so um, uh, I'll try to be quick in this first introduction and, uh, and uh, uh, I look forward to your questions. I will um, cover briefly, in fact, uh, five, five points. Uh, the key parameters of the negotiation that we know very well, first point. The second point, uh, what has changed in the last months? Third point, is there really a hope for a breakthrough? Fourth point, what would, what would the breakthrough be? Uh, and fifth, how to reach it? All this is about the DDA negotiation, of course. Uh, briefly, the basic parameters of the negotiations, we know them very well since... Uh, uh, at least uh, when we stopped in June last year. Uh, 
Um, agriculture is the key to, uh, to unlock the uh, negotiations, but uh, it's not the more important uh, aspect of the negotiations in, in terms of economic uh, impact that it can have. The real benefits of the round will not come from agriculture, will come from trade facilitation, goods, services, including the rules, and will also come from the development uh, dimension of the DDA. I think we should not uh, forget uh, this point. Um, we uh, know that uh, in order to unlock the negotiations, we have to uh, get it right on agriculture. Uh, I remind you the key figures in this respect. The EU has offered a reduction of tariffs for agricultural goods of 39% and indicated that can move further if the others uh, do too. Uh, G20 proposed 54.5% uh, of reduction in average, the U.S. 66%. Um, there is an important uh, confusion about the sensitive products. Everybody realizes, uh, recognizes that it is important. Uh, and uh, there was this idea that particularly for the EU, but not only others, uh, two uh, sensitive products means closed market, which is not true at all. And I think it's also an important dimension to keep in mind. Um, uh, domestic support, uh, this is probably the key issue within the key area, and uh, there I think the U.S. Uh, is the key uh, uh, partner. We need to uh, see uh, movement on domestic support from the U.S., and of course the U.S. sees this uh, related to the market access that uh, they can uh, get. Uh, so, uh, all in all, the uh, challenge that we are facing is about reaching the right balance. Um, for the uh, EU, the right balance, of course, is uh, not, uh, it's clearly global. It's not only within uh, agriculture. It's agriculture, goods, services, and rules. So, this was true uh, last June and is exactly true today. So the second point, what has changed? I think that's, uh, we need, it's probably the more interesting uh, aspect of, uh, of what we, we need to think about today. What has changed really? I would argue that we have uh, six things that have evolved and uh, influencing the prospect of the negotiation. First, the uh, political high level pressure or focus. We have an extraordinary uh, concentration of attention at the highest political level, uh, Bush, Merkel, Barroso, Lula, others. Uh, I think we, we, we managed to create uh, a, a, an extraordinary moment of high-level political uh, focus, and this uh, counts in itself and creates the condition for uh, progress. Uh, second, we have done between EU and the US uh, a very good uh, amount of technical work on agricultural issues. Not that the EU US will solve the round or will decide on how the round will go, but we have to get it right uh, at least around this agricultural discussion that uh, uh, we had with this other very intensively these last months. Somebody said in these agricultural uh, technical discussions, I repeat, that there was a kind of black box, you know, the amber, blue, and the other boxes. Well, they said there is a, a black box. And uh, so a box that you cannot see what is in there. Uh, this included, um, of course, sensitive products um, and other uh, technical arrangements. Um, somebody else said a couple of weeks ago, well, we eliminated the black box. Probably black box was uh, an exaggeration and eliminating was also, is also an exaggeration because there are always areas where more technical work is uh, needed. But I think it's important to recognize that a lot of good work has taken place there and at least we understand uh, better where we, um, we stand. Uh, in the same time, uh, I would like to underline it's important to be realistic about what technical, uh, this kind of technical work can achieve. Uh, the breakthrough will not be worked out in that kind of uh, uh, negotiating uh, forum. forum. Uh, so that was uh, something significant. Uh, third point, 
Uh, it's all the pressure that is created around this uh, TPA extension uh, debate. Uh, of course, we have our U.S. friends that tell us, uh, don't worry about the TPA. It will happen if the substance is uh, here. Let's concentrate on substance. And that's true. We accept that. Uh, we understand that. Still, the prospect of the U.S. Uh, without a TPA uh, eventually sometime uh, during the summer uh, it becomes it's disturbing for many, and uh, um, it creates a de facto pressure. Maybe not uh, now for the month of March, but certainly for uh, May, June, uh, it puts a pressure to the system, which is not necessarily bad. Maybe the system needs some uh, positive pressure towards the solution. Uh, fourth point, the farm bill. Again, the farm bill... For us, we said it was a little bit disappointing from some point of view. Disappointing because it did not give a clear message that uh, it was not a clear indication that uh, the U.S. was seeing the farm bill as a kind of uh, an instrument that allows to move aggressively towards the direction where we all hope that the U.S. will move, that is reducing domestic support. On the other hand, we fully appreciate uh, that uh, the farm bill does not prejudice a good, uh, a good deal, and uh, it can be adapted, and uh, there are several months of a very intense discussion that will take place in this country, dominated by domestic considerations, uh, not so much by the WTO, uh, but uh, the, the, uh, the necessary adjustments can uh, uh, take place. Uh, but there again, uh, I mean, it's obvious that it's much better uh, to have a WTO deal before the farm bill is finalized and vice versa. So there is some amount of, uh, uh, of uh, pressure in the, right, in the direction of getting a, a, a deal that is created uh, by this uh, process and the timing of the farm bill, although, again, we recognize that it is uh, basically conducted uh, on, the, uh, on domestic considerations, uh, at least for the time being. An important, interesting aspect of uh, this uh, debate that will come on us around the Farm Bill is um, how much the um, de facto important elements for uh, our WTO negotiations, all this debate about the conservation aspect of the Farm Bill and also the dimension of uh, ethanol, the fuels, the new fuels and all that, how important will they become in the coming months? Because de facto, even if they are not linked to the WTO, if they become significantly important, they can create a kind of additional space of negotiation that we probably do not realize completely now. But it's a question mark, not more than that. A, um, fifth point that has evolved, I think we have collectively, um, on a global scale, I would say, uh, realized better uh, the cost of failure. This was something that has been underestimated, and it's probably not, uh, still not completely valued at its uh, right uh, uh, level. I think uh, we, uh, we collectively, as I said, realize better that uh, it's important from the point of view of international trade uh, that uh, we, will, uh, we have a lot to lose because what is on the table is very important. There is a good deal on the table that, of course, we hope that we will improve it, but still, uh, it's something very uh, valuable, and of course, uh, a credibility will, from uh, the point of view of the credibility of the multilateral uh, system and agreement, will add to that, will make it more efficient. Um, but it's, um, it's not only trade, I think uh, more and more people realize how important this deal will be uh, in the wider debate about the globalization and the anti globalization. The protectionism uh, reactions that uh, uh, protectionist reactions that we uh, see around uh, not only on trade but uh, on a wider basis as I said in the wider anti-globalization uh, agenda and of course uh, people realize how bad it will be for the developing countries and particularly the LDCs if this uh, important uh, development agenda of the DDA is lost. Um, Last point uh, uh, of what has changed, of course, uh, Davos and uh, the fact that uh, as a result of Davos, uh, the negotiating groups in Geneva have uh, started, have resumed to a great extent uh, their good uh, work and there is 
uh, this uh, dynamism of uh, ministerial, bilateral ministerial uh, uh, meetings. Uh, mainly undertaken by uh, the major partners, but uh, with the understanding that uh, an inclusive multilateral process is to be established uh, quickly. Uh, so that's what I would say are among the main evolutions of uh, the last months. Now, is there really uh, a hope for a breakthrough? Uh, Susan Schwab said on the February 14th in a hearing at the House Ways and uh, Means Committee that uh, she's cautiously optimistic. Uh, Vice President Dick Cheney said around the same time to the National Association of Manufacturers that the, I quote, the administration is a bit more optimistic. Well, I think we can agree with these uh, comments. Uh, in the sense that uh, it's a huge challenge. I think that's what the comments say. Uh, there is hope. We believe it can be done. It's possible. But it's a huge challenge. And certainly we agree uh, with that dimension of the, uh, of the comments. On the other hand, really, if you think of the six points that I uh, made, it's clear that now, in the coming months, it's better from the point of view of the TPA, the farm bill, the political attention, the political concentration that uh, the, 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 the theme has, um, the work that has been done. It's a good moment for it to happen. And if it does not happen within the coming months, we enter into very difficult scenarios. TPA extensions, farm bills, uh, loss of confidence, it's difficult to... To, to, to find arguments why uh, later is better than sooner. So if you see it from that point of view, um, you are very close to those who argue that this is really a window of opportunity. And uh, you become close to those who argue that uh, that's probably the few months that will make it or break it at least to a very significant extent. We have to see progress. If not, we enter into more difficult scenarios. From our point of view, we are very committed to advance, if others do. And uh, we will uh, develop a huge effort, all the effort that is needed uh, for that uh, purpose. Let me tell you briefly what would the uh, breakthrough be. Um, as I said, what we are looking for is... Uh, the right level of uh, ambition and balance. We need, we need an agreement which is really strikes the right equilibrium, the right balance between uh, uh, the ambition of, of, uh, of all the participants uh, involved, of course. So on agriculture, the, the key lines really, on agriculture, uh, we see a convergence around the G20 tariff proposal. Uh, I said and I repeat, the U.S. has really a really vital role. We need uh, the whole system, not we only, uh, all the partners. Uh, we need real cuts to, re to trade distorting farm subsidies. Uh, we evaluate the need of uh, cuts, the cuts needed to around 8 billion from the ceiling of 23 move to somewhere uh, around the 15 billion. We need disciplines with these cuts to prevent over-concentration of subsidies on specific uh, uh, commodities. The emerging economies, uh, they have to move on goods and uh, services in a proportional way. Not the same way, but in a proportional way. And of course, uh, rules including anti-dumping and geographical indications are very important uh, for the EU. If we see this movement coming from others, we gave, already, we gave already a clear indication that uh, the EU would add probably more than 10% on the 39% tariff cut offer that we have presented. Uh, we said clearly that uh, market access will be uh, important for all products, including the sensitive uh, uh, products. So we are talking about significant additional market access uh, for all agricultural products. And, of course, uh, we are willing to lock into the WTO uh, our 70% uh, uh, cut of distorting subsidies, 
that we have announced already a number of years ago uh, uh, unilaterally, but lock this in the WTO and the complete elimination of export subsidies on agricultural uh, products if the others uh, do the same on similar uh, supporting schemes. Um, uh, last point, how can we reach that uh, breakthrough? I, I'm, there are many, many conditions and many ways, ways to heaven, of course. But um, I will mention three, uh, three points. Uh, first, I think it's extremely important that we uh, appreciate uh, what is on the table. I think we, we need to create a common uh, understanding and appreciation of, uh, of the value of uh, the package that, t that is on the table, because this will make us more realistic in our expectations. You know, it's very easy to be ambitious on what you ask to the other side. Okay, and, and not more than a minute. It's very, it's very easy to be ambitious, to ask ambitious concessions of the other side, but we have to be ambitious in the effort that we have to put in the system, and we have to write the strike balance with what is possible on the other side. And if we really appreciate what is on the table, we have the right balance to strike this uh, uh, balance. We, we have the right starting point to strike this balance that uh, uh, is needed and adapt expectations, make them realistic. Uh, second, we need to move together, really. Uh, nobody will present new concessions uh, unilaterally. Uh, this does not mean that we will have to sign at the same moment, but it means that uh, progress in agriculture that we know has to uh, happen has to be combined with clear indications and a priori commitments of movement of the others in the other areas uh, that, uh, that I mentioned. Final point, we need to work, to work hard, not only on the, uh, on the uh, negotiations, but also uh, in uh, the important job of uh, convincing the domestic constituencies that uh, each one of us uh, has. And I say that because nobody will be completely happy with this uh, uh, agreement. There is no perfect deal on the table. There is a very important uh, deal that uh, where we all have to pay and we have to pay more to reach the right ambition and the right balance. From the EU point of view, we are uh, very ready and committed to move in that direction and with that uh, spirit. And we hope that the others are too. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, uh, Angelos. Uh, I made a, note, uh, a short note of uh, one uh, thing that you said that I consider to be the key. Uh, we are the advance if the others do. And the problem is that we all think the same. We are the advance if the others do. So <laughs> we need to, to, to move ahead. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Matt Roth. Uh, Matt is uh, replacing Ms. Um, Dorothy Dwoski, and uh, he's also from uh, USTR. Uh, the Matt, the audience is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate uh, being able to fill in for Dorothy and uh, attend this event. I think it's rather interesting and worth noting that uh, the way this uh, panel was constructed, uh, regrettably because of traffic and, and the weather, uh, didn't quite turn out, but that this panel was constructed uh, originally with speakers from, of course, the EU, the US, Brazil, and India. I point that out because I think one of the clear uh, elements that marks the Doha round right now is the fact that when one speaks of the majors now, uh, one is speaking of a different collection than one spoke of, say, during the Uruguay round. And in fact, the majors are in fact considered not only the US and the EU, but also Brazil and India certainly are considered majors. Um, and it's, it's worth noting because I think it, it lends to the, uh, uh, the nature of the Doha round as well as, as perhaps some of the challenges and struggles, uh, as well as the advancements that uh, we've had uh, there. Uh, 
In terms of our perspective, I, I guess um, the question that's always asked is, is one hopeful, is one not hopeful? Uh, certainly Ambassador Schwab said two days, two days ago that she was cautiously optimistic. Um, I think there's no doubt that there is a, a clear, new, renewed sense of urgency that, that emerged through January. Um, I think you can look to the Davos week and, and beyond. Uh, and I, I think it's, it's uh, an urgency defined more in terms of a willingness to intensify the work. Our view is that with the impasse last July, that what needed to be done, and indeed is going on right now, um, is, is some quiet uh, work uh, to examine a little bit behind some of what are called the headline numbers. We certainly all have them memorized, uh, the headline numbers pertaining to average tariff cuts that are being proposed and cuts in trade distorting domestic support. Um, but <clears throat> what, what one of the problems certainly last July was a, a clear lack of clarity. The term black box was used uh, to, to define the fact that uh, the flexibilities that were being proposed uh, were not accompanied with much certainty. In addition, um, and it, it's one thing to be using combinations of the headline numbers to, to forge a result, but I guess our perspective was and has been that what has really been needed has been some drilling down behind that. Is this a bilateral process with us in the EU? Well, certainly we are working on it. We are working on it with Brazil. Brazil is working on it with others. Um, and I think we see this process as having a potential, along with the clear sense of urgency that's developed, of leading to what I guess we are calling a potential breakthrough. The shape of that breakthrough, I think, um, is something that, that we would characterize as, as a, a evidence that, that uh, we are back on a path and toward a successful outcome. Now, what do we see a successful outcome of DOA being? Um, as, as, as has been stated over and over for us, the litmus test is actually rather simple. And it means ensuring that we have a DOA outcome that results in meaningful new trade flows. And not only in agriculture, of course, but also with regard to industrial goods and services as well. And insofar as we are working toward a, a, a breakthrough that, that puts us back on the path, it's also pretty clear that, that that will have to address not only agriculture and breaking the deadlock, which of course is key to moving forward, but also addressing uh, the NAMA and services negotiations and moving them forward. I think that, that in addition, it needs to be noted to the, the informal work that's going on. Another clear sign that has emerged this month uh, can be found with the resumption of the work of the negotiating groups in Geneva. Uh, which, which has begun, and, and obviously the informal work that's going on is complementary and will, will be building outward and ultimately multilateralized um, if we are to be successful. But again, I think that, that um, the work uh, will only be successful uh, with uh, clear contributions uh, concrete contributions, not just by the United States. We're, we're reminded always of our vital role, and we're, we're certainly cognizant of that. But, of course, there needs to be a, a contribution by many to take this work forward. Um, what has changed? I think there are many factors that could be cited, but I think uh, part of it was the, the, the fact that uh, I'd like to think that two days after the July suspension, uh, Ambassador Schwab 
uh, immediately went and met with uh, Minister Amram, and I think began a, a quiet process that went on through the fall, involved uh, all WTO members, that ultimately took us to the point where we are now. How this plays out, I think, is dependent on us. Um, I'm, I'm always, uh, well, I, I'm always amused to hear political commentary being offered, and I, I must say every time I go to Geneva that, that uh, it's, it's walking through the hallways sometimes is a bit like watching Crossfire because uh, everyone seems to have an opinion on uh, the U.S. political process, and I've been working here 25 years, and I certainly, uh, I think I know less about it than, to, than I did 25 years ago, so it's, it's always uh, interesting to hear the commentary uh, suggested. But I think it's worth noting that, that the, the process does stand alone. The, the work and the responsibility to move DOA forward toward uh, getting it back on a track toward an outcome uh, is only going to be done through hard work, not through negotiations in public or, or uh, speculation as to how the political process unfolds in the U.S. I mean, it, plain and simple. Um, we need a strong outcome. We need an outcome that's going to result in meaningful new trade flows, real trade flows. And, uh, and indeed, in terms of the development dimension of Doha, um, it's, it's pretty clear that that will be the biggest contribution toward development, will be a strong market access outcome, not just in agriculture, but also in industrial goods and services. So. With that, our perspective is, I guess, one of a significant challenge. We are pleased with the sense of urgency that has uh, developed, um, and we're, we are uh, working tirelessly and will continue to uh, get the negotiations on a path toward a successful outcome. And I guess I'd end there. Thanks, Matt. Uh, we'll be passing immediately to Ms. Banaschi Harrison. Uh, she's an economist, diplomat, and Minister for Commerce in uh, Embassy of India. And uh, uh, right after, we'll be uh, listening uh, Roberto Azevedo that's already ready to make his speech. So, Banaschi, you have um, uh, 10 minutes for your uh, talks. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to apologize by, uh, I'd like to begin by apologizing for arriving late. Uh, I'm a relatively uh, new arrival in, uh, in your beautiful city, and I haven't yet figured out the ins and outs and the roads, and I thought I left it all to my driver who left me quite a long distance off, and I enjoyed a nice cool walk. <laughs> so you can expect some very cold remarks from me. But let me um, at the outset say that uh, India is really committed to the success of the uh, Doha Development Agenda, to the Doha Development Round, to the success of WTO. I arrived late, but so did the developing countries. I think the multilateral trade negotiations, many of you here would be experts in that, and you're aware that the process started long ago. And the one of the reasons why I think there is difficulty being faced in the last two, three, last three, four years since the development agenda, is that negotiators are better informed. It was easier earlier because there were relatively fewer interests to coalesce and to amalgamate. Today, the developing countries as a block, but also as each separate member, are much more alive, and they are much more aware of the issues. And also, we must remember that Democracy, while it is a wonderful thing for negotiation at the multilateral table, it poses difficulties because what you negotiate in Geneva, you have to go and sell to all your states, to all your provinces, to all your political constituency. Now, as far as India is concerned, I think what we see as being very important and which is why we are very 
pleased at the revival that this year has seen in the process is the atmosphere of trust. Because somehow, after the Hong Kong ministerial, we felt that the biggest victim was the sense of comfort, the sense of trust, which had begun in Doha, which had begun to link the developing and the developed countries in Doha. In Doha, when we saw development being put at the center of the agenda, I think it caused a lot of satisfaction. It was the reason why developing countries, let's be quite, quite frank, the reason why developing countries came to the table. They came to the table with lots of hopes and aspirations, focusing on the development part of the Doha development agenda. And post Hong Kong, somehow many of us, certainly India, left feeling that some of the issues, some of the successes which had been achieved with considerable give and take on both sides were not, we could not take them as given anymore. We could not even take the focus on development perhaps as given anymore. My commerce and industry minister made himself, I think, quite unpopular in different forums by focusing on this. And what has to be understood is when India speaks, it actually speaks in two capacities. One is as India, a country with a billion strong population of which 650 million depend on agriculture. We talk of, you know, b b bumper sticker numbers, headline numbers. I'd like you to keep this number in your mind. That when you are talking about anything which happens at WTO which affects agriculture, it affects 650 million people in India. And I would imagine that according to our estimates, across a billion people in the developing countries. Uh, that is a number that you've got to keep in mind as well when you are talking about other stickers. And the, the expectations that we have are that these compulsions that any democracy dealing with 650 million number, the compulsions that that country has when it comes to the table are perhaps different from that of a country which is dealing with these issues as basically a, a trade issue, as an issue which will affect the bottom line of companies. Here we are talking about livelihoods. You know, I'm, I'm not going to uh, uh, appeal to the bathos and talk about the numbers of farmers. Actually, I am doing that, number of farmers who commit suicide in India. But that is a fact, you know, which has to be kept in mind. Now. I was saying that we speak in two capacities. One is, therefore, as India, with its, you know, with this whole package behind it. And the second is, as a responsible and as a vocal, as sometimes over vocal member of the developing country bloc. We have developed, we have seen growth over the last 15, 20 years. We are hoping to touch 10% uh, rate of growth. Uh, this year uh, on, a, on a steady, uh, right through the year. But, the, but India remains not just what we used to call when I was studying economics 25 years ago, a dualistic economy. We are a, uh, we are a multiplistic economy. It's not just two or three economies, it's many more than that. It's not even one, it's, you know, you talk of urban-rural divide, but in India it's not even just urban-rural. The rural sector in Punjab, for example, which saw the fruits of the first green revolution 30 years ago, that rural sector is very different from the rural sector, let us say, in Andhra Pradesh or in Madhya Pradesh or in Bihar. So you're talking about a country which, though it has developed and can certainly say so proudly, it still has a large number of clusters for whom agriculture and related issues remain a livelihood issue. And we therefore can understand perhaps very emphatically when we are engaged with the developing countries in discussing these issues and when they, when we all talk about this, this is something that resonates with us. And we have been involved not just in, uh, you know, G20, G33, um, you know, NAMA 11, what have you, but practically with every developing country that we engage with and our engagement with the developing bloc, in fact, has intensified over the last uh, uh, decade, not, uh, not grown any less simply because we have become developed and are sitting at the, you know, 
sitting at the tables uh, with, with, with the developed countries. Our engagement with the developing world and our commitment to those interests have also grown. Consequently, at times, we are uh, you know, caught between the devil in the deep sea, to use a cliche, because left to just India, even with our restraints and constraints, we might be able to offer a little more. But because you also have the interests of a, a block to, to uh, represent, it somehow reduces your space. And therefore, to us, what is very important is to have the atmosphere of trust, I think, rebuilt in the negotiations. And this is what we see happening in the beginning of this year, which is, which is a cause for hope for us. Because we see that the demands that have been accepted in the past after hard negotiations, those should not be reopened as, as, as a almost as a compulsory condition for going ahead. What, I'm, what am I talking about? <clears throat> we are hearing repeated references to real market access. Now, this was an issue which was discussed, which has been discussed at great length. Those of you who followed the uh, WTO negotiations are aware of it. This is something which has been, uh, which has been uh, agreed that it will not be the real, you know, it would not be the uh, the real market rate in the sense of the applied tariff rates, but the bound tariff rates which would apply. And this is important to India because we have, as we have globalized, as we've opened our economy, uh, we have liberalized autonomously. And it's almost like saying that, you know, you're going to be, not be rewarded for the fact that you've been doing something which you should have done, but, uh, you know, now we want even more from you. So that is an issue. And then also on the uh, insistence that, uh, that there should, not, there should be less than proportionality, less than full reciprocity when you are dealing with uh, developing countries. Now, this again is something which has been already negotiated. So reopening of, uh, of points which have already been agreed to, I think, cause discomfort and distrust to build up. And this is something that we would like to see addressed, and we are seeing addressed, and that is causing us hope. The last point that I would like to touch is the question of the time frame. Now, what is perhaps uh, hampering uh, steady progress is what we see uh, as, a, a, as a civilizational thing on the railway stations in India, uh, particularly in the north where uh, there is a tradition of uh, extreme politeness, I would say. You would see two or three people saying, no, you get onto the train first. And, you, and the other one says, you get onto the train first. And it ends up by everybody missing the train. And what is happening, I think, is that the country X is taking the position that, no, well, put what you have to offer on the table. And India is certainly saying, well, we want to see what you have to put on the table before we put on the table whatever we have to put on the table. And this means that we might end up missing this particular train. But I think what's important is not just getting on the train, but that the train should go to the right place. And I think while we have and share this great sense of urgency, we would not like to see the time frame become the critical element replacing the importance of development being the ultimate goal. Thank you. Thanks, Bahari. Uh, let's go uh, with Tim right now and then having Roberto. Or, so let's go with Tim. Tim, Tim Reif is the Chief Democratic Trade Council for the Committee on Ways and Means in the U.S. House of representatives. And he is also a professor of law, uh, of law here in the Georgetown University. So, Tim, the odds is yours. Okay. Th uh, thank you. Can everyone hear me? I'm sorry to join you uh, late, and uh, it's my own problem because I'm, I'm speaking blind into uh, who has spoken so far? 
Everyone has spoken. Okay, great. Yeah, well, have, let me be brief because my comments may be more useful uh, in the context of discussion that may follow and make just basically, uh, I guess, four points. Uh, the first, uh, as to Doha, uh, I think it's, it's uh, platitudinous that what the Congress expects uh, at this point from Doha is an ambitious uh, breakthrough. Uh, there has been, I think it's safe to say, sufficient uh, let me put it this way, when you raise Doha with, and my remarks as always are off the record, um, when you raise Doha with members of Congress, senior members of Congress who actually know what Doha means, uh, there is typically a dismissive look because they've heard it so many times before. The negotiations are starting, they're stopping, they're starting, they're stopping. Uh, we're five years in, two years over uh, the scheduled uh, completion date. I think it's safe to say, unless the breakthrough, the so-called quote-unquote breakthrough that's being uh, discussed is meaningful in all of the different areas, uh, that it will not be taken very seriously at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue. Meaningful means uh, agricultural market access. Uh, it means industrial products market access, in particular a meaningful addressing of non-tariff barriers. And it means uh, substantial new access and services. Uh, hearing just the very tail end of my colleague from India's presentation, I think members of Congress look at this as what more will the Indians get, what more will the United States get, what more will everybody else get. And so the point about applied versus bound uh, is not, I think, will not receive a lot of sympathy uh, in the Congress. Secondly, uh, where are we on in the Congress? A couple of points. I think for the first time in, in some respects, most significantly since the mid-1970s, uh, you see the locus of gravity shifting from the other end of, we're right in the middle, I guess properly positioned here this morning, from one end of Pennsylvania Avenue down to the other. Why? For a number of reasons. The expiration of, uh, the, expiration of the trade negotiating authority provisions, uh, the uh, I think what has been a bottled up trade debate for a number of years, which I'll come back to, and a new opportunity uh, following the elections in November to actually discuss trade meaningfully uh, and in a more uh, complicated way than is typically done in the press or by opposing sides in debate. So I think, uh, firstly, there is a locus of gravity shifting down towards the Senate Finance Committee, the Ways and Means, and the to respective chambers. Secondly, I think uh, there is a genuine effort uh, to restore what has traditionally been the approach to trade in the United States, which is bipartisanship. Uh, that was missing almost entirely for the last six years for various reasons. But what you see and what you see discussed uh, is not simply uh, public relations. I can tell you over the last month uh, there is a genuine effort and I can speak most directly to this as between Mr. Rangel and Mr. McCrary, the two, the senior Republican and the senior Democrat on our committees, on my committee, uh, to restore uh, a working relationship. Uh, so it is genuine. Now, uh, will we have a press release to issue this afternoon on working out the issue of labor and free trade agreements or may latest by Monday noon or Tuesday noon? Uh, no it's going to be very, very difficult work on all the various issues. Trade has never been easy, easy politics or easy substance. But uh, the effort is, I can assure you, very genuine. Uh, let me finally say, uh, with respect to the work that the Congress and the administration are doing, I think it's important not to underestimate the difficulties that uh, the United States and other countries find themselves in in terms of the trade agenda. We're going to talk here, I think, primarily about Doha today. But the United States is also facing uh, a free trade program that has uh, basically run out of steam. There's only one agreement that is really focused on very significantly in economic terms, which is the Korea Agreement, which is in serious trouble, just a little more than 45 days or less than 45 days before its completion date. 
uh, there is a serious concern, even among very traditional economists, over the size of the trade deficit and the role of the United States in being the balancing wheel for a system that's a little bit out of kilter, focusing in particular on China and Japan. There is a feeling, I think, uh, in the public uh, that you saw reflected in the election of lack of confidence in the administration's trade policies. Uh, they are trying to correct that in a very gradual and slow way uh, through uh, stepping up their degree of enforcement. But these have been issues that have been called for in very specific, responsible, WTO consistent terms for six years. And this kind of change tends not to happen overnight. So I don't in talking about the new effort at bipartisanship, you could not ask for anything more. Uh, I can give you an illustration. Yesterday, uh, Congressman Rangel was scheduled to meet with President Torrios, and it so happened he was meeting with Mr. McCrary before that on another subject. And it was just natural for him to invite Mr. McCrary to stay, and they took the meeting jointly. And many of you know that Mr. Rangel's first meeting, as requested by Ambassador Schwab, Mr. Rangel insisted that Mr. McCrary be at the meeting. There is a genuine effort by the two of them when you see them to work these issues out. So I can assure you that the effort is, is going to be made. Let me say a word about the least developed countries. It is a concern that I think you all know uh, Congressman Rangel shares, and not just uh, in his rhetoric. Uh, he, along with a few others, uh, is responsible for our African program that took effect in 2000 the major expansion of our Caribbean and, and uh, Central American program that took effect in 2000, um, and the other uh, programs. I think it's safe to say that in our committee we are going to take a hard look over the coming 18 months at uh, the, uh, all of our preference programs, including GSP. Uh, Congressman Rangel was the driving force last year uh, to renew the GSP as is notwithstanding the criticisms that some made of products from my colleague's country or from Brazil, uh, Mr. Rangel thought it was not wise to make any changes uh, to that program. So we will have a careful examination. We want to understand whether the program is working well for, uh, certainly for India and Brazil. We want to understand whether it's working very well for the least developed countries. We do not take at face value the, the suggestions that have been made that if we only exclude jewelry from India that the several hundred thousand people working in that industry will find some other way to make a livelihood having just left agricultural production and that all the production will flow to the least developed. The evidence seems to indicate that the, the lion's share of that production would go right to China. China is not doing too badly in terms of its trading relationship so that may or may not be the wisest policy choice. So these choices involving the least developed countries and the programs of how to interact with the whole developing world are not simple. We are going to look at them very carefully and push forward. It's safe to say also that we cannot answer these questions in the four parameters of trade policy. We have to have a more effective linkage between trade and development policy, including enlisting uh, the active work of the presidents of the regional development banks and the World Bank. And I think you're going to see concrete proposals in these areas coming out of uh, uh, Chairman Rangel in the coming weeks and months. Finally, let me say it's not entirely clear that some of the choices that have been made in the Doha uh, development agenda make sense from a development perspective. The round for free that the now Director General of the WTO uh, promulgated uh, may or may not make sense with respect to the lowering of tariffs between least developed countries, not between the least developed and the developed world, but amongst each other. Is that a policy that really makes sense? It certainly was good rhetoric. It certainly won the, our friends in Brussels a lot of plaudits. Does it make sense? These are the kinds of questions that I think we need to ask ourselves. Let me like make a last comment on probably what is a key keen point of interest, which is the issue of the relationship between Doha and trade negotiating authority. Uh, I made my comments about Doha in that I think that uh, if there is a breakthrough, which we all hope there will be, uh, it will be examined very carefully. There is not a high level of credibility on the claims of the administration or others with respect to the uh, trade agenda. So I suspect there will be a very careful independent examination of where, what the breakthrough means, what it may mean for an ultimate agreement, since of course it won't be the ultimate agreement. 
Uh, and uh, uh, that will be a key factor as Congress looks at trade negotiating authority. But let me say two other points and then close with that because I'm probably over my time. The first point is that Doha is not the only factor. There is, I think, a restlessness, and if I might be so bold, I think it exists on both sides of the political aisle uh, in the House and the Senate with the administration's trade policy. And I think there will be a, a, an examination as to whether that pa trade policy is evolving to deal with issues like the trade deficit, like our, uh, the unfair trade practices involved in um, a number of trading partners. I don't want to single any particular one out. There are our trade deficits, as everyone knows, are largest with respect to uh, China, the European Union, and Japan, and that order. And there are very, those are very important markets to the United States where we face significant barriers. So I think there are a range of issues that members of Congress will be looking to see as the middle of the year arrives and we begin to discuss trade negotiating authority in a serious way, uh, whether those kinds of uh, changes are being made and that there is a renewed trust to provide this kind of authority to the President. The other uh, point I would make uh, is that uh, it is not likely that trade negotiating authority will be in place on July 1st. If anyone knows the American legislative process or a legislative process in any capital takes some period of time uh, and no groundwork has been laid over the preceding year or two uh, to lead up to this, certainly no work in terms of deconstructing the partisan political environment and other matters. So what I think you want to look for from capitals uh, around the world is whether there is an active and constructive process underway in Washington uh, led by changes to the way trade policy is conducted that is laying the groundwork for an eventual renewal of trade negotiating authority. Remember under the old, uh, under the clock in terms of the WTO, we do not need trade negotiating authority on July 1st because we will not have a le piece of legislation to move. We would, in the best of circumstances, and having been through the Uruguay round, let me underscore the best of circumstances, there would be an agreement by the end of this year uh, which would take six months or so to prepare legislation for. That is, let me underscore, probably the best case scenario. A hopeful scenario, one we'd all love to see, but the best case scenario. So uh, at the time frame, uh, I uh, would urge those to be realistic in understanding that that's uh, probably the time frame that the Congress will be operating under as well. Thank you. Thanks, team. Well, uh, after these words, uh, let's see what uh, the chief negotiator uh, for Brazil has to say. Uh, Aluizio, how this will uh, be working, the connection? He's listening. So, Roberto, uh, the odd thing is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to confirm that you see and hear me, or or just hear me. <laughs> no, the image is, is okay. Uh, we are seeing you. Okay, so I'm you hear me well. I, that's good. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. Um, I think uh, I should start by saying that uh, the round is a very high priority for Brazil at this point in time for several reasons. I think the two most uh, important ones are that uh, first, uh, they don't happen very often. And second, uh, they are the only means of addressing the broad range of issues that actually discipline international trade. Now, uh, why is it a priority for us? And I think that uh, I should talk a little bit about the birth of this round. Uh, I heard, uh, for example, just a moment ago, and by the way, I'm not going to refer to all the comments that were made earlier because the image and sound here were on and off uh, for, the, for, this, for the duration of the debate, so I, uh, I missed uh, some of the interventions. But uh, I would say that, uh, for example, there was a comment by the, uh, by the EU uh, representative saying that uh, agriculture is important, but it's not the most important economically. But I, if we go back to the origins of this round, uh, we'll see that the, 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 the whole reason why this round exists is because of agriculture, because of agriculture. 
There is an article, it's Article 20 of the Agricultural Agreement, the Agreement on Agriculture of the WTO. And in that Article 20, it mandates a review of the agreement. And the EU at the time, and that, that review was to take place by the end of the year 2000, and the EU at that time said, look, I'm going to be obviously one of the main targets of this review. So if anybody expects this review to be meaningful, and therefore to get some actual uh, results out of this, we need to do this in a broader context. In other words, we would need, we the EU, would need to sell the, 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 the results of the agricultural review with gains elsewhere, with gains in industrial goods, with gains in services, with gain in all the other areas that are under negotiated negotiations right now. Now, so, if we have a round that doesn't truly yield the results that we expect, that, that the whole world expects in terms of agriculture, this round is, does not justify its own origin. Um, the fact that Brazil and the other developing countries are placing a lot of emphasis in agriculture, it's not because they had made an economic option on agriculture, but it's exactly in agriculture where the major distortions lie. And this is what uh, we believe is, is unacceptable. So we don't, if we don't have a satisfactory, mutually satisfactory agreement in agriculture for everyone, and mind you, uh, for, for the poorest of the, of the countries, um, it is in agriculture where the, 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 the heart of this negotiation is uh, in economic terms as well. This is where they get the benefits, where they derive their, their the resources for their survival, mostly. So agriculture is the heart of this negotiation. It must yield meaningful results. Um, but going back then to, uh, to the round as it is today, what, where are we? Uh, we had the impasse in July 2006. We all know what caused that impasse, so I'm not going to uh, uh, review those again. But uh, in Davos, uh, negotiations were relaunched. Uh, particularly the Geneva process uh, uh, was, was uh, resumed. Now, what changed, actually? Um, I would say that two things changed. The first one was the political will. Um, but then you, you will hear people correctly saying this political will was there in July as well, in July 2006. Uh, there was a G7 meeting. And in that G7 meeting, all the heads of state and government said that they supported the round, that they wanted a successful conclusion to the round, and still that, that, that did not translate uh, into advances in July 2006 when the ministers met in Geneva. So uh, as that episode makes abundantly clear, political will is not enough. It is necessary, but it's not enough. Then we go to the second element. The second element is that together with this uh, political will, there was clearly um, a new engagement at the senior official and technical level, uh, particularly with uh, some uh, key uh, players, some key negotiators. Um, some new avenues uh, were explored, some new technical ideas were put on the table, now the question is, will those avenues, these new avenues, be enough uh, to get the positions close enough so that we have true convergence? And to be frank with everybody here, uh, I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, there is still the, the, the black box that uh, people mentioned before, uh, the lack of clarity. We are at this point in time, um, getting some transparency into that box. Uh, we are trying to understand better uh, what all the elements mean, uh, what the level of ambition is in all the particular areas of negotiation, but we're still trying to understand that. Uh, once, let's say, once the black box becomes a transparent box, I'm not sure that uh, we're going to like what's in the box. Uh, so that's still out there. Uh, we don't have the crystal ball at this point in time to know whether this process will effectively uh, lead us to uh, a successful uh, breakthrough. But I am hopeful. That's what I can tell you. I am hopeful. Uh, I have seen signs of change. I've seen flexibility where there was no flexibility before. Uh, but there is still a long way to go. 
Um, let me tell you also um, one thing about uh, about uh, the the next steps. Uh, we are trying to see whether enough of meaningful access or uh, progress is possible by April or May, uh, June maybe, I don't know, but somewhere uh, during the summer. Uh, but it's not uh, clear whether we'll be able to do it. Uh, there are a number of other elements in play. Uh, obviously, the, 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 the renewal of the TPA is a crucial element as well. To the point uh, when, when Tim mentioned that uh, uh, there would be a very close scrutiny about uh, the level of ambition, about uh, how, how good the package is, how meaningful it is uh, in Congress. Uh, but uh, there are two points I must make here. One is that um, it will be very difficult to get uh, all participants in this negotiation uh, putting all the chips on the table when the final package is under the risk of being uh, unraveled by uh, a, 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 a rejection of the package in Congress. Uh, people do not want to negotiate twice or three times. Uh, once they put the chips on the table, once the package is agreed, it will be very difficult to come back to the negotiating for the U.S., to come back to the negotiating table and say, look, um, thank you very much. This is a very nice package. Congress doesn't like it. I need some more. Uh, this is a very, very, very difficult situation. And of course, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty in this process. And um, it makes negotiations extremely difficult. Uh, people are, are, are still engaged. People are still trying, but if we don't have uh, a successful evolution of the discussions in the TPA, and I, and I was there uh, not long ago, I talked to a lot of congressmen, and I can testify to their, to their uh, interest, to their good faith effort into saying, look, this is a difficult issue, we're, go we're going to do our best, we're going to do uh, the best that we can, but, um, and, and I take that. And I take that as a, as a, as a good faith effort. But uh, we also have to look at the reality. The reality is that this, until we have um, a successful conclusion of the TPA process uh, in the US, negotiations are not going to be made any easier. Um, I, I will probably stop uh, uh, here. I would just say that. Uh, as far as Brazil is concerned, we will continue to engage. Uh, we will continue to act as constructively as possible. We are interested in all areas of negotiations and we are ready to contribute in all areas of, of the negotiation. Um, but uh, we cannot forget that this round has an element of development and we will be looking for that. Uh, we also need a balanced agreement. We need a proportional agreement an agreement that takes into account the specific needs of developing countries as well. Furthermore, um, we, we need an agreement and we need a process where people, where all the players are mindful of the sensitivities of the others. Look, the U.S. is not going to offer us the cuts in domestic support in agriculture that the world is hoping for. The EU is not going to offer us the the access in the, in the market that the world is expecting from the EU. Uh, they have sensibilities, they have sensitivities, I'm sorry, they have sensitivities. Uh, we have to mind, to bear in mind those sensitivities. But developing countries also have their sensitivities and they must be respected as well. So if we go along the road of uh, we need, and I'll make two very quick examples at the beginning. The EU mentioned in the beginning of this conference, agriculture is not the most important eco uh, factor, economically speaking. I, I, I disagree with that. That depends on the point of view. Uh, from a developing country who is a major agricultural exporter, and I'm not talking about Brazil, I'm talking to a number of others, that, that statement is not valid. And just a moment ago, when Tim was saying what, uh, what a meaningful result is, um, 
I think Freud would explain that he forgot to mention domestic support. Uh, that is crucial as well. That's part of the assessment of whether the, uh, the, the agreement will be meaningful or not. Again, uh, a successful round is one where usually um, you give more than you're willing to give and you get less than you want to get. Uh, and Brazil is ready to do its part. Uh, we're, we're ready to give, but we want to see um, um, good results on the other end as well. So thank you very much, and if you have any questions, uh, I'll be here, uh, I don't know, until the connection lasts, I guess. Thanks, Robert. Uh, so uh, let's open for uh, debates. Uh, I think there are some uh, very interesting comments to be made. Uh, as we are, uh, let's say, we are in the schedule, uh, we will have 15 minutes uh, for debates and then we will have a, a break. Uh, would you like to start, uh, uh, Luisa? Well, thank you for, for the honor. Uh, I'd like to make a question to, uh, I guess my, my questions will be, to our uh, representatives from the United States, the executive and, and Congress, and uh, just to put a little pepper in the, in the discussion. I like if, if you could, both the perspective of the executive and from Congress, to what extent uh, do you think that the present discussions on the U.S. Farm Bill can be a limiting factor to U.S. negotiators on, on the Doha round? Um, <clears throat> I guess I'll make a go at that first. Um, Tim reminds me I too should also note that all my comments are uh, off the record. Uh, it's always good to have congressional oversight. Thanks for coming, <laughs> Tim. Uh, I mean, I, I, with re I, from the perspective of uh, where we sit, um, the Farm Bill is a domestic process that has just begun, full stop. And uh, in terms of uh, restraint on negotiations, I think that uh, I would just, again, you know, repeat that, that and it certainly was echoed by Tim, that, that uh, our view is that, that we are looking for the most ambitious result that we can get. And, um, I mean, Tim can elaborate more on the on the process involving the Farm Bill, but you know, at the end of the day, it is a domestic uh, legislative process that, in fact, has just begun. Tim? Well, I don't... Uh, I thought, actually, there was enough pepper in the conversation, Aloisio, but you can never add too much, I guess, in the trade area, huh? Um, I don't speak for the Agriculture Committees. I think, you know... Uh, and as to the minister, the reason I didn't mention domestic supports is I think the equation for us is clear in the United States, which is that uh, if, there is, um, if there is sufficient market access, obviously uh, the domestic support factor can come into play. But I think I'm glad you asked about the Farm Bill because I think uh, there, is, there will be a substantial temptation in the coming months as these negotiations get very, very difficult. If there is to be something of meaning... Uh, in the coming three, four months, it's going to be very hard, by definition. There will be a substantial temptation to begin to say things like, oh, we, we can't do this because the Congress hasn't renewed trade negotiating authority, or, or we're not sure where we can go because the Farm Bill is shaping up to be largely an extension of current policy. That's not the fundamental, we can do that. Those debating points will be a clear indication that this is not going to work this year, that Doha will not succeed if we get into that kind of a discussion. You'll note in my comments that I did not say that a breakthrough was a precondition to trade negotiating authority. I said that, among other indications uh, and among other factors, are going to be an indication to the members as to whether this administration's trade policy is changing in ways that it needs to, it needs to change. With respect to Farm Bill, uh, it seems to me the critical question is, where will the Farm Bill be when uh, the uh, results, we hope, of the Doha round at the end of this year are concluded? Is it a Farm Bill that will take that into account? 
Uh, has there been a dialogue between the Secretary of Agriculture, the U.S. Trade Representative, and really the White House uh, that pulls together all the various parties uh, that has a realistic dialogue? Uh, I think there are significant problems with our friends in Europe, other people's farm policies. I will say internally uh, that dialogue really has not been very much engaged by this administration to date, and that's got to start sometime. No better time than now, uh, because you can't get to the meaningful discussion unless you have that kind of a, a dialogue. We have started it. We've been in, we've been, uh, the new Congress is barely 45 days old, and I can say that my chairman has already had conversations with the chairman of the House Agriculture Committee. We'll be meeting with the full Agriculture Committee to exchange views. There are few people in the Congress that are as identified with liberalization of American trade with the least developed and developing countries than the man I work for. Uh, but he's going to want to have a dialogue with the Agriculture Committee because he understands that there are different perspectives. You can't get through this either in Geneva or in the United States if you don't begin that dialogue. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, just for benefit of the audience, please say your name and uh, your position. Let's start with this uh, man here. Go ahead. Thank you. My name is Mike Choi. I'm with the U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, Tim, you mentioned that uh, the U.S. FTA agenda, that it's running out of steam, and in particular, Korea is in serious trouble. Uh, first, I'd appreciate you to elaborate on Congress's concerns with the uh, U.S.-Korea FTA negotiations. And if you have time, uh, just your view, if you can elaborate more on Congress's concerns with the current FTA negotiations. Thank you. I'll be very, very, very brief. First, let me say to everybody what I should have said at the beginning of my presentation. I think the uh, those who are now uh, in charge of the Ways and Means Committee in the Congress have three top priorities in trade policy, Doha, Doha, and Doha, which I think is a shift. So I think that's good news to those who are concerned about Doha. FTAs, Korea, the number one problem is automobiles. We don't have a proposal on the table that's sufficient to uh, address it, let alone begin negotiating with the Koreans. There's also, there are also some other issues like pharmaceuticals and, and uh, beef. Uh, with respect to the FTA program, I think everybody knows that there's a process underway to try to address the labor standards issue. It's not the only issue in FTAs, but it's the biggest uh, single issue. And I am hopeful that over, over some period of reasonably period, short period of time that we can we can figure that out. Okay, uh, in the back. Thank you. Uh, my name is Javed. I'm at the center. And I would really would like uh, Mr. Pangratis to respond to the points raised by the Indian and the Brazilian representatives. When you spoke of the costs of failure, you asked us not to forget what's on the table. That, to me, reads like code for not expecting much in agriculture. And if we are really saying that, uh, and if you are saying that, then you're really denying also the spirit of the DDA. You are denying uh, part of the reason why the G20 was set up to prevent a repeat of Blair House Mark II. And you're also denying what Mandelson had to say last year, and, he, and I'm going to paraphrase. I haven't got his precise word, but he said that we need an agreement that takes from those that have and gives to those who need. And by your definition, a success of the Doha round would really be a failure to achieve all the reasons why the Doha round began in the first place. Thank you. Can I? It's <laughs> for you. And all this is because we would uh, uh, evaluate uh, in its right value what is on the table now. I mean, the point that I made is uh, simple, and I think it's, uh, it, it, has to, uh, it can be easily uh, understandable. Uh, I didn't say that we do not intend to move more. I said clearly that, uh, as Mandelson said, and as we have said repeatedly, uh, we are willing to move, to move further from what is on the table. But it's important to understand uh, what is on the table. Uh, the minister talked again about uh, the black box, and I think we have suffered a lot during the last uh, year uh, from a different perception of what was uh, in offer, what was on the table. And there was a little bit too much of devaluating 
what was there. And my point was, we need to look at the real facts. We need to appreciate what is on the table, because what is on the table is already significant. It doesn't mean that uh, we will not uh, go uh, further. We said that we are willing to move further under some conditions, like everybody else. And uh, what we see happening is also, uh, I think, getting uh, clearer. We have, I believe, uh, given uh, quite uh, concrete indications of what uh, moving further means from uh, uh, our point of view. But for many respects, I will not enter into the details, o what is already on the table that we are negotiating about, uh, we consider that it's better than what we have seen in the previous rounds, and by far. And it's important to realize that. This was my uh, point on what is on the table. Not to underestimate what will come, but I think we need to take both in their right value. Uh, your uh, points um, answer what was said on agriculture. I think I'm glad to do that. In fact, uh, of course, I intend to, to find the moment to do that. Because what I said is that agriculture is not uh, where the global uh, benefits will come uh, from mainly. We do not underestimate at all the importance of agriculture of, or, or in this negotiation. Uh, and I accept that uh, it is in agriculture that we have the higher distortions, probably, in terms of international trade, and we need to improve that. And we accept that that's the key uh, to move into the other areas of the negotiation. So by all means, we are very committed and we accept the importance of the agriculture, but it remains an economic fact that globally it's not from agriculture that the main benefits of the round will come. And I think that's simply a fact of life. It can be different for specific countries, or people can see it different. But uh, for us, it's a very strong element that it's obvious and it needs not to be forgotten. And I would add that uh, even uh, particularly probably for the poorest country, it's not so simple to say that for the LDCs the benefits will come from agriculture, really. Agriculture is very important for those countries, but they have a substance agriculture. They don't really have the potential to uh, export so much. And a lot of their exports, at least as far as the EU is concerned, it's already uh, benefits uh, of full free access. We get something, what, 85% of agricultural exports of African countries? Uh, they get free access to our markets, but they don't get free, market, free uh, uh, market access to others, and particularly to other developing countries. And you know uh, that uh, something between half and two-thirds of uh, the uh, import duties that are paid on the exports of the developing of the LDCs are paid for their exports to developing countries. Uh, so this uh, concept of, uh, uh, I think Tim said, a uh, round for free and uh, free trade among developing countries. I think it's, uh, it's really uh, something that uh, needs to be looked into carefully because we believe uh, quite uh, strongly that it, there is a lot of value into that. In fact, the liberalization of trade among developing countries is uh, very important for the developing countries and particularly for the least uh, uh, developed uh, countries. Um, I don't know if I'm missing a point from, uh, I don't know what point of our Indian colleague you were, you were referring to. Um, if you think of something specifically, I'm willing to comment on it. Okay, Roberto, uh, Roberto, uh, Roberto is still there, right? Would you like to have the third reply? No, Roberto is not listening. <laughs> no, I'm listening. Oh, this is the advantage of being right. distant. He can listen. He can listen. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. yes, Roberto, you have the third reply if you want. Yeah, well, uh, I don't essentially disagree with the things that were said by the others. Um, it's a matter of, of a focus, I think, more than anything. Um, I. I fully understand, uh, for example, when Tim said about the domestic support that they need more market access and everything, I, I understand that. I agree with that, in fact. Uh, but uh, it's, I was just pointing, for example, on the, on the perception of what is meaningful 
for example, uh, by listing, and it was not intentional, I'm sure it was not intentional, but by listing his list of priorities, of course he did not remember uh, where the pain is. You know, everybody tends to look at the gains, but they never look at the pain uh, because it's not very pleasant, I guess. Uh, but I understand, I, I, take, I take his points fully. And um, I, again, I also said, for example, when he mentioned that it is not a, that uh, the, the breakthrough is not a precondition to TPA and all that, I fully understand that and I, under, and I accept that. And that is one of the reasons why Brazil is still negotiating, because we all know that whatever breakthrough we have now will not, be, uh, will not lead to the conclusion of the round within the time frame of this TPA. So we are, in fact, negotiating already with the cover of a TPA. And we haven't walked out. We're still out there. We're still negotiating. I'm pointing out the difficulties that it would, uh, in, in, that, that would uh, derive from the fact that the TPA is not uh, renewed uh, during negotiations. Um, going back to what the EU said, uh, I, you know, it's factually true that globally agriculture is uh, not uh, where the main uh, economic results will come from. I, I understand that, but uh, you know, people don't feed themselves globally. Uh, they, they need food on their table. Uh, they, make, they make money on the exports that they sell, on the, on the product that they put on the market. You know, there is no entity as a global entity, so we have to look at the reality of some developing countries, and they are not, they're, they're not homogeneous. Um, there are some arguments, for example, that I've heard before and that I heard today again, uh, that uh, you know some poor countries are not competitive in agriculture. They don't have the means to compete. They don't, they don't sell their production. Um, that is in part, I'm not saying totally, there are some exceptions, but that is in part precisely because of the distortions and the protectionism that exist in agriculture. A lot of these countries are not competitive because commodity prices are depressed. And they are depressed because, either because uh, there is a lot of subsidies, there are a lot of subsidies out there depressing the prices, or because their products do not reach the markets, because the markets are closed for domestic consumption. For example, it is true that the EU, for example, imports uh, bananas from Africa, uh, and that it's duty-free uh, when it enters the EU market, but only from African countries, only from ACP countries. There are countries in Latin America that export bananas that have huge difficulties to put their production into the EU, and these are poor countries as well. And we cannot think that uh, we cannot uh, uh, separate countries by lots, uh, and this is this is. This is what I've been trying to get at. We, what I'm saying, basically, is that we need something that works for everybody. We need something, we need an agreement that is proportionate and that is non-discriminatory, that removes these protections that, in fact, hamper the ability of developing countries to participate in the global markets. So we are going to work. We are going to be uh, fully engaged. And again, we're not asking anything from anybody that would disrupt the markets, that would disrupt the structure of production, that would cause massive unemployment or anything like that. But uh, we need reciprocity. We're not asking for that. We will ask for the same from the others, that they also understand that we have our own sensibilities. As far as we're concerned, we'll be acting and we'll contribute in all areas. Okay. This discussion will continue in Geneva. We have one last question from the lady in the back. Hi, uh, Andrea Ewart. I'm a trade attorney. Uh, I work on Caribbean trade uh, policy issues. My question uh, concerns the uh, time frame issues. Uh, I've, I've heard a lot about uh, hope and optimism and so on, but not a whole lot that suggests, uh, as actually the uh, uh, Brazilian uh, speaker just indicated, that there is going to be a deal uh, any time this year. And so my question is, uh, and, and when you add to that uh, the capacity concerns of developing countries, as uh, Ms. Harrison pointed out, many of which came late to the table, are still struggling to understand what are the implications for them of 
the various uh, offers that are on the table, the various positions that they can put forward. So is it time to look at a more uh, realistic time frame for these negotiations and what would that look like? That's to anyone on the panel that chooses to address it. To whom are, are you addressing your question? Anyone on anyone. the panel that chooses to address it. She said anyone. Okay, so Ting, would you like to start? I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> no, I can't talk about what the time frame is in Geneva. I think it, uh, the sooner the better, frankly. These negotiations have been going on too long. I think we need all of us to harvest the result. I find the minister's comments curious because just a few months ago he was meeting with Congressman Rangel, and I think he knows where Congressman Rangel's position is on domestic support, so I assure him that there was no Freudian issue involved in how I made my presentation. But I, I caution the minister and others not to oversimplify. One of the major problems we face in public policy, and I would say in trade maybe more than other areas, is the oversimplification of discussion. Let me give an, as, as an illustration. I uh, took some, uh, raised as a criticism the fact that least developed countries are not, under the current structure, likely to lower their tariffs to each other. But one key reason for that, or one key problem in doing that, is that many least developed countries are telling us they have no other way to raise revenues outside of customs duties. Have we, the Brussels and Washington, Tokyo, other countries, the Scandinavian countries, come together to try to provide a system uh, of greater tax collection for least developed countries so that they can begin to lessen their reliance upon customs duties? We all in the developed world faced this issue a number of years ago. So that we can't that issue of oversimplification is that we in the trade world can solve everything. We can't. We've got to work outside in the development area. It doesn't mean more money necessarily. That might be uh, an element, but it also means to try to reconcile programs between the me major players where now we may be duplicating effort or sometimes working at cross purposes. One illustration. A second illustration. Uh, I suspect that, that my members will look very, very carefully at issues in the Doha results such as non-tariff uh, barriers, and we'll probably press our Indian friends who uh, have not been that forthcoming. At the same time, we were the members just four months ago, and we are still in the same place now, who fought tooth and nail the efforts of the, the then majority in the House to cut the benefits of Brazil, to cut the benefits of India under GSP, because we thought those were not advisable steps. So I just, as we go into what I think will be a very, a year full of, of important opportunities, but as is always the case, if they are important opportunities, they are also important challenges and difficulties. Not uh, to succumb to the temptation to oversimplify uh, positions, because I think the positions, which I think is a good uh, observation to make, a positive observation to make, I think positions in the trade area are not as caricatured as they actually are, are uh, made out to be. Okay. Sure. Uh, a brief comment, really. Um, on what Tim said, basically. I think this dimension of uh, the development agenda is extremely important. And we started with that already some time ago. And uh, I think from the EU point of view, we concentrated uh, uh, very strongly on the development uh, uh, dimension of this uh, uh, round. And it's important that we have some degree of consensus on the, on the key elements of the development dimension of uh, the Doha Round. Of course, development is a wide uh, challenge, um, uh, but uh, the concept of uh, aid for trade was created in there to address the issues to the extent possible uh, that he mentioned, like uh, you know, revenue from customs duty, for example, or the ability of the least developed country to export. It's clear that these people cannot these economies are not ready to fully compete immediately, so they need to uh, become able to compete. And we have a special responsibility. And we consider that this uh, package that there is in the DDA, the development package, is extremely important. And uh, we have done a lot of work on it. We have a line that we believe strongly uh, in support of every aspect which is in favor of uh, development. And uh, I see Tim mentioning uh, issues that uh, uh, sound familiar, and I just want to say that they are very important for us and we are very keen to engage in any way uh, in the process of uh, uh, creating a, a, an understanding on these issues. Uh, a second uh, point, it's true that we should not oversimplify the trade issues. 
but it's also very uh, dangerous to overload the boat and uh, complicate the process too much. I mean, we had some uh, experience some time ago with the Singapore issues that the colleagues uh, know well. Uh, we tried to put into the, uh, the process uh, some dimensions that I, we still believe they were completely uh, justified. Um, um, but then at some stage you overload the boat and you break a process if you overdo it. So we have to be uh, very careful. Once again, it's about striking the right balance. Okay, Matt. Uh, well, she will be you know, women, of women always like to have the last word. So, uh, well, reacting to something which Tim said about the GSP, and he also mentioned it uh, in his talk, uh, I thought I must make it clear that, in fact, not even a quarter of India's imports to the U.S. actually benefit from GSP. And not, this does not include many gems and jewelry. It does be benefit from it. But there are a large number of our labor-intensive commodities which do not enjoy the GSP benefit. And this includes products like textiles and leathers, which are our main exports to the U.S. And in fact, uh, it may surprise you to know that one of our keen interests in Doha Round is also to receive the substantial tariff reductions for such items. Uh, where, in fact, the tariff rate uh, is as high as almost 30 percent in the U.S. market. And, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, the, the basic point coming to the question that uh, the, the lady made is that I, I think what has happened this year in the, from the beginning of this year is that not you, you don't get to see any substantive We haven't yet seen um, any substantive changes in people's positions. What has happened is that one is clear about the major players at this stage, which seems to be US, EU, and the developing countries, notably India and Brazil, but there are a whole lot, but uh, as a block, perhaps. And what is noticeable is from the beginning of this year is somehow the fatigue that had set in. I think the rest over the last year has, has taken care of that. And there seems to be a new enthusiasm to, to think out of the box. I mean. When that phrase was made, it was a really new phrase, but I think even that has become a cliche now. But you do see a new vigor and new enthusiasm in the negotiators. What they bring to the final policy makers, whether that is something really different, and whether the policy makers accept it and then they can sell it to their own constituencies. This is something which I don't think anybody here will, uh, short of a crystal ball glazer, be able to predict. Uh, I do hope that what Tim, the time frame that Tim has given does get realized, but I know that for us and for many in the developing world, what is the outcome is perhaps more important than the time frame, even though we have gotten, all of us have gotten rather bored with the Doha, uh, Doha uh, uh, development agenda dragging on for so long. Thank you. Okay. So Matt, you have the final comments. Well, well, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> I, I guess my perspective is just as a plain old trade negotiator and with unfortunately, increasing emphasis on the word old. Um, I, I think in response to your question, uh, however trite it may sound, um, our view is that, that it is, in fact, content and substance that's going to dictate how this moves forward, when this moves forward. Certainly, as Tim said, sooner the better, and that's our aim. On the other hand, I think we've learned um, that, that deadlines, at least in this context thus far, have not uh, served the purpose that we would have wanted them to. And I think that, that not only will content dictate, I think I just would simply underscore that there's a lot of work to do. And we certainly have a process, a good process going. Um, I was interested in the exchange going back and forth about the relative importance of agriculture and the overall scheme of things and certainly um, the idea that it is less important I normally associate with having increased flexibility so I will take to heart what we heard from our European friends uh, on that. Um, so uh, just to underscore there is a lot of work, there is a lot of goodwill, there's a sense of urgency but I think no one knows how this is going to come out. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. With these final comments, we are closing this panel.